hi guys we are in the chapter on therapies so you will be seeing peer lectures from your classmates and uh, from the other section uh, coming up in a couple of days but I wanted to give you a quick overview um, some things that you want to pay attention to in this chapter in terms of therapy we can look at individual therapy or group therapy a lot of therapists do a little bit of both um, uh, most of your chapter addresses individual therapy and theories around that, um, but family therapy, group therapy are very, very common. Um, most of the therapy that we uh, will read about in this chapter is called talk therapy because we spend a lot of our time talking. Um, I work with children and I do something called play therapy because we spend a lot of time playing but through the play we are communicating with each other and I'm learning a lot about children in the process. Many therapies are called insight therapies because they allow us to think about why things happen and often when we can figure out why we do what we do it helps us to manage those behaviors. Therapies are also dis um, distinguished between non-directive like client-centered therapy, for example, and directive therapies, which are more like rationally motive behavior therapy, which the therapist takes much more of a lead in directing where the therapy goes. Um, you will see through the peer lectures, we address some terms like hysteria, which is a psychoanalytic term. Freud came up with that back years and years ago. We've already talked about that a little bit. Humanistic therapies, uh, the most common one is called client-centered, which I mentioned just a moment ago. And one thing you want to know for sure is one of the issues in client-centered is called unconditional positive regard, UPR. And one of the peer lectures addresses this. Unconditional positive regard means that we take seriously our responsibility to help people regardless of what they've done or what their belief systems are people have value no matter what and it's a super important part of being a good therapist you have to be able to set aside your own belief system and your own uh, preferences to recognize that people deserve help when somebody comes to the emergency room the doctors don't ask them uh, about their politics or their religion or their behaviors they help them and that's what therapists do um, existential therapies, as you'll read through your peer lectures, are really more about meaning of life questions. They're addressing the free will that we have and the um, what do we want to get from life. So that's another sort of uh, focus of therapy. Gestalt therapies, we've heard this word throughout the semester. Gestalt means whole. Remember that from way back when? Uh, gestalt therapy was um, developed by a guy named Fritz Perls. And a lot of Gestalt therapy, I don't necessarily like myself, but there are a lot of activities in it that can be very helpful. Um, and if you read your book carefully or read your peer lecture, you'll see some of that. Behavior therapies, I'm not going to spend much time on because we spent um, two full days talking about behaviorism. But the basic basis behind behavior therapies is that we use rewards and punishers uh, to try to modify behavior. I use a lot of behavioral interventions with children because talk therapy doesn't work so well with children who are either pre-linguistic or limited in their linguistic abilities. Another therapy that you'll see in your peer lectures is something called EMDR and that stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. In EMDR, literally the therapist uh, causes the uh, client to watch a finger moving back and forth and that eye movement does some things that allows people to interestingly access memories and thoughts that they can't do otherwise. When it first came out, I was a little skeptical of it, but it has become very, very common and it's very effective, especially with trauma-based issues. Um, I mentioned REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, and the main thing that you'll want to remember from this uh, section is that our EBT therapists are looking for irrational thinking, irrational beliefs. So things that we think about that derive our behaviors that don't make good sense. Um, and you can read more about that in that section, but that's sort of the gist of it. Family therapy, super important because families are called systems. Families work together as one person interacts, it affects everybody else. And uh, many therapists like myself are both 
individual therapists, but also marriage and family therapists. We work with uh, couples and we work with entire families. So I may have uh, seven or eight people in a session at one time, uh, children, parents, and sometimes extended family if they all are interacting closely together. There are a couple of other sections toward the end of the chapter. One is a section on effective therapists. Unlike what most people think about, therapy is not giving people advice. We don't do that. We listen to people and we help people make decisions that are best for them. So we spend a lot of time in something called active listening. We're listening to what people are saying. We're listening to what their behaviors say to us and what they look like, because the way we look says something about who we are. In fact, I put on this point shirt for today because I wanted to look uh, somewhat like I might if I was in class with you. Active listening involves paying attention to all of this at the same time while people are, are talking and trying to make sense out of what they're saying and where they say they want to go and helping them to get there. We do a lot of reflection. So as people are talking to us, we're reflecting back to them what they've said. So if someone says, I've had a really hard time lately, we might say uh, something like, wow, the last few weeks have been difficult for you. And I know that seems sort of redundant, but it lets people know that you're hearing them. And that's especially important as a counselor. I try to avoid questions um, with my clients, even with children. A lot of therapists ask a lot of questions. I just don't because it has some problems that uh, if we were in class, I'd get into a little bit deeper. But we can use questions. And if I do use them, I use what's called open-ended questions, meaning questions you can't answer with a single word. So closed-ended questions would be easily answered with a yes or a no or something like that. So I might say to a child, um, tell me about your weekend instead of, did you go to the park this weekend? The latter question was closed-ended and the former question was open-ended. As therapists, we do not prescribe medications. Psychiatrists, um, medical practitioners do that, but medication can be an important part of therapy. And we've talked about that all semester long. We started with that in the section on neurology, how some of our behaviors can be affected by our physiology. So sometimes medication is very important. And especially if we're talking about people saving their lives, um, they can't get along without it. Um, I'd rather somebody take medication than uh, not survive. So that's something that we work closely with physicians uh, about. There's a section in your text on hospitalization. In the old days, when I first started practicing therapy, uh, people were hospitalized quite regularly. Often they stayed for three to four weeks um, and insurance paid without question back in those days. Nowadays, uh, it's very, very different. Hospitalization is something that we do very, very rarely and only if people's lives are in jeopardy. Um, so if people have eating disorders that's compromising their safety or they're suicidal, then we might. And hospital stays typically are very, very short. Um, there are partial hospitalization processes that your text talks about, and those are a little bit more common where you're an outpatient. You might spend part of your day in therapy uh, in a hospital and then um, spend the night at home, or you might spend the night in the hospital and in the mornings and evenings do some therapeutic work and then go to work during the day. The one last section in your PowerPoints is on evaluating a good therapist, and those are really important. I'm not going to read all those to you, but make sure you look at them because deciding is the therapist right for you is a super important question. And in general, if you're not comfortable with your therapist, you probably should find another one. That's sort of the bottom line. So I always encourage people if it's not clicking for you after a session or two, you might want to look around and any ethical therapist will help you find someone else. So if I have a client who comes to me and says, I really would rather find another therapist, I don't take it personally. I want them to be helped. And if I'm not doing it, I want to help them find the right fit. Uh, any therapist who would take offense to that and especially make it known, that lets you know you're making the right decision by finding another therapist. So that's sort of an overview of the chapter. The uh, peer reviews have been really, really good. So I'm looking forward to this group, which I'll send out to you like I did last time. And thank you all for your participation. And let me know if you have questions. Thanks all. Bye.